One of the things that is part of this section, section 4.4, .4, is the discussion of the ambiguous case. But before we go into the ambiguous case, there's a few things that we want to talk about that have to do with basic trigonometry that have not been covered yet. Um, at least I haven't mentioned them. What about uh, the Pythagorean theorem? You probably know this one. Okay, so the Pythagorean theorem states that for some right angle triangle whose sides can be denoted as A, a and B and whose hypotenuse is C, that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And literally, you can actually form this concept by, by imagining these to be distinct squares whose sides are of length C for this one, B for this one, and A for this one. And if you take the area of that square and the area of that square, you do get the area of that square. You do get the area of square C. So if you have an A by A square and you add it to a B by B square, you will get the C by C square. So it is, you know, it, it does literally translate into uh, things like, you know, actual squares, actual areas of squares. So, um, well, that's the Pythagorean theorem, but there's something related to it, which comes from our good friend, the unit circle, which I never seem to get enough of. And if you look, let's just take a look for a minute at where the unit circle came from. Remember it came from the Cartesian coordinate plane and I'm just going to draw it here again. Okay. And I'm going to do my old fashioned uh, my good old uh, unit circle. Um, I'm going to show you something here. So um, that goes to 5 so we'll just draw our circle here. Oops. It's uh, a little distressing when the compass goes a little out of alignment. When it went to the inside of the circle, and now it's outside of the circle, now it's going to the inside of the circle. So, anyway, you get the idea. Here's the, here's our unit circle, and. Um, if you recall, this is the point 1, 0, this is the point 0, 1, this is 0, negative 1, and this is negative 1, 0. Um, and then we, you remember that we drew some, drew some terminal arm here, a terminal arm that went to some random point here x, y, which turned out to be cos theta, sine theta, right? Where we say that the x coordinate is cos theta and the y coordinate is sine theta for our unit circle. And it's uh, rather remarkable that that, that be the case because if you look, okay, so this is cos theta going from here to here if you recall sine theta is this opposite side and this is theta. Now why am I going over this again? Well it's because this shares a relationship with the Pythagorean theorem. That's because if this is height y and this is of length x then x squared plus y squared equals 1. For the unit circle, right? x squared plus y squared equals 1. But didn't we also say that x was cosine and y was sine? Right? We said that over here. So we can now, now say that, well, it's customarily written with sine first, so sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1. This is called the Pythagorean identity. 
So we have the Pythagorean theorem here where this works for any right angle triangle of length ABC. But this here works for the special triangle that's drawn inside a unit circle. At the sine squared of theta, the sine squared of an angle plus the cos squared of the same angle always equals 1. This is true for all theta, doesn't matter what. Okay? So this is called the Pythagorean identity. So it's a really, really important thing because what we're going to learn in this section is going to be related to that identity. It's a pretty good, pretty good thing worthwhile knowing. In fact, you'll be learning this, you'll be using this again and again, not just throughout this semester, but throughout advanced functions, uh, throughout the trig unit and advanced functions. So it's worthwhile uh, remembering that. And notice that this is nothing more than the opposite squared and the adjacent squared equals the hypotenuse squared. One squared is just one anyway. Whereas here, this works for anything. So if, if A was 3 and B was 4, then C would be, what, 3 squared and 4 squared? Sorry, 3 squared and 4 squared. Um, so that's 9 and 16. We get 25. So 25 is C squared. So what's the square root of 25? 5. So C must be equal to 5. Okay. So that is, uh, that is the Pythagorean identity. All right, so now let's go on with some other things that are also related to angles and the trig functions of those angles. First of all, we have um, for some random triangle, now let's just say it could be any kind of triangle. It doesn't have to be a right angle triangle. In fact, preferably, this can be for whatever triangle you like. And let's say that we have any angle at all. A triangle, of course, consists of three angles. Those angles add up to 180 degrees, okay, if you recall. So that, um, and of course, the a triangle, a typical triangle, need not have any sides that are 90. Um, these, uh, these angles could be any angle they want. The sides could be really any length at all, as long as the shape closes somewhere. Okay. We'll call this A, we'll call this B, and we'll call this C. There's no, no system to this, except that when you finally decide on what's A, B, and C, then the angle opposite C gets capital C, the angle opposite A gets capital A, the angle opposite B gets capital B. Okay? Uh, the reason we follow this system is because our equations work a lot nicely that way, and it, they're a lot easier to remember if you remember to arrange your sides on a triangle in this manner. So let's first of all talk about the sine law. Because, well, you know, the Pythagorean theorem and SOHCAHTOA were ways that we could rely on to resolve a right angle triangle. But you see, over here, because this is not a right angle triangle, we can no longer rely on the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what the sides are or even what the angles are. So let's say that, okay, so let's, let's talk about the sine law now. And it is true that the sine of angle C over side C equals the sine, you know what, why don't we go in order of the letters? I don't know why I started with C. Sine of A over side A equals sine of B over side B equals sine of big C over little c. That's the sine law. And of course, you know, you could flip these over too. You can write them this way. A over sine A equals B, little b, over sine B equals little c over sine C. A, a nice relationship. This is a, 
these are easy fractions to work with, a lot easier than some of the other ones, like for, for example the cosine law. The problem is the sine law does not solve every possible problem. There will be some problems you will not be able to answer with the sine law. For example, what if you wanted to, what if you didn't know any of the angles but you knew all of the sides? then the sine law is no good to you. You have to know at least one angle and one side, right, for the sine law. Uh, and preferably, uh, you have to know an angle and its opposite side. The others could be a mystery, right? The others could be a mystery, or maybe you need to know another side, you know, uh, in order to solve a triangle. Uh, but this is actually, uh, there, will be, there will be times, for example, whether you, maybe you know, um, all of the sides but none of the angles and the sine law is no good to you. Um, so there'll be cases like that and there'll be other cases where once again the sine law is not very good to you. They just don't come to my mind right now. I know there's at least one other case. So in order to um, supplement this um, we also come up with the cosine law. So the cosine law is seems to resemble the Pythagorean theorem a little more. So if we have like for example c squared equals a squared plus b squared which kinda looks like the, the uh, Pythagorean theorem except you got this bit at the end minus 2ab times, times the sine times the cosine of angle c. This is one way of stating the cosine law. Well, that's one way. There's actually three ways of stating the cosine law. Because, well, what if, what if it's a, a squared that you want to find? So, or a, side a that you want to find. Well, then a squared is equal to b squared and c squared, b squared plus c squared, minus 2bc cosine of A. Notice the pattern here. Basically if if a side is on here then what ends up on the other side of the equation are only mentions of the other side but then the cosine of the angle has to match the letter for the side. So you could probably guess that if we're going to do B squared then what should go here by that reasoning? Well, it should be a squared plus c squared, because none of them are b. So a squared plus c squared minus 2, same same letters, okay, is this, ac, cosine, g. What, what's the cosine of now? Oh, you just look at this side, and you know you have to use capital B, cosine of angle B. Okay, so that's the cosine law. So that's the cosine law, that's the sine law. So we have here um, we have here some random triangle. I mean, I could have made this into some other kind of triangle. I mean, it doesn't have to be that shape. It could have been, say, something crazy looking like this, for example, um, an obtuse triangle. But I chose just a standard scalene triangle. And uh, from that, from any of these triangles, we can derive the cosine law and the sine law. The idea of uh, the sine law is that um, uh, I, I understand some people have tried to get this to work for right angle triangles, but I believe it's overkill because we already have Sokotoa and the Pythagorean theorem. You don't, for me, uh, I'm a believer in using the right tool for the right job, and you know, I, I wouldn't. I mean, that you could use them for the right angle. You could use these five equations for the right angle triangle, but why would you? They're so complicated. Uh, you already have Sokotoa and the Pythagorean theorem, and now you even have the Pythagorean identity to help you solve right angle triangles. Why resort to, you know, why resort to uh, using the sine law and the cosine law unless you have to, right? And in a situation like this where there are no right angles, you have to. You have to use some combination of one or the other. It And it all depends on what's unknown. Like sometimes, for example, you might think, 
oh, I, 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 I'm sort of in the mood to use the sine law today, or sorry, the cosine law today, and but then the, the, the problem can be written in such a way that you can't use the cosine law. Sometimes you, you realize you can't use the cosine law, sometimes you have to use the sine law. And, uh, you know, this is where, you know, um, certain combinations of knowns and unknowns just prevent the cosine law from being a thing. Uh, usually, usually what happens, if you follow the pattern of these equations, it's usually the, you have to know an angle and the two adjacent sides. You don't have to know the other angles. But you do have to know the involved angle and the two adjacent sides in order to find the third side. And that's usually a, a key, a key, um, a key clue uh, to um, use the sine law. Well, okay. So let's um, let's solve a problem using trig ratio. Well, you can solve a problem using trig ratios, but we're not going to do that. We're going to solve a problem using the sine law and the cosine law. I'm, if you need a review with your trig ratios, uh, my advice to you is to go to page 250. There's a, there's a problem there um, that you can solve uh, using standard trig ratios. So I'm going to give you one, one example using the sine law, one example using the cosine law, and that'll be it. So here. I'm going to pull an example from the exercises and um, I'm just going to, in fact, maybe, maybe we'll just look at question one because again, we're, we're asking, we're being asked for the most appropriate trigonometric tool uh, from among your ratios. All right, um, so we have a problem here that says for each of the following, select the most appropriate trig tool among the primary trig ratios, sine law, cosine law, justify your choice. Don't solve, but just what do you think would be the best way to go about it? Well, I can tell from 1A right away that you can just use primary trigonometric ratios and that's whenever you see one of the angles being 90 degrees. So right away, that's a deal breaker for any other, any other kind of trig function. Over here in part B, in PQR, we have 35, 65, and we don't know the third angle, but we can find out because you can subtract from 180. And we, we're given that P is three meters, determine Q. Now we don't have to solve, but we have to figure out what's known and what's unknown. So, okay, let's try let's try out sorting out what's known and unknown. So we have basically a triangle, and we are told, oh, one of them's 35 degrees. I'm not trying to solve it, but I'm just trying to draw myself a picture. R is 65, and this is this remembers angle P, this is angle R. And little p is 3 meters. Okay, this is little p. So determine, uh, determine q. Well, q must be this one, which is the angle we didn't mention. So q, side q is the one we want to find. So what would be, what would be that? We have an angle, another angle, and a side. Well, okay, this... Um, Okay, here's a clue. We Remember I told you that for the sine law, you have to have an angle, and opposite that angle, you have to know a side. So if you know an angle and you know a side that's opposite, then that's a major requirement for the sine law. It's not apparent, though, because you don't know how, what about this angle and opposite side, and you have to know this is what you're being asked to find, right? You're being asked to find Q, but you know, why Why did they pick Q, right? Well, it turns out it's okay to pick Q because remember that you can take 35 and 65 and subtract from 180 to get this angle, whatever that is, okay? And once you know that angle, now you can use the sine law um, to find out what Q is. So that's perfectly fine. 
What about DEF? For D equals 60 degrees, F equals 50, and D equals 12, determine F. So we have the triangle DEF. So D is 60, F is 50, and D is 12 centimeters, determine F. I think it's the same thing. So we're saying we're just relabeling these. So we're calling this D E F. So D is 60, not 65. E is E is what? E is Oh we don't know E, but we know F. F is 50. So we don't know we don't know this one at all, but F is known, it's 50. 50 degrees. And D is 12 centimeters. Well, when they say D is 12 centimeters, they mean the side that is opposite D. This is 12, right? D equals 12. It's the side that's opposite D. Determine F. This is the part we don't know. So this is a classic example where we don't have to think about this as hard as we had to think about the last question. Here we have to use the sine law because we know an angle and an opposite side and what we want to find out is a different side that's opposite an angle we do know which is perfectly fine for this one we have the right combinations of knowns and unknowns to to use the sine law so xyz x is 42 degrees well we only know one angle so x is 42 degrees this is x this is y and that's z Okay, um, and little z is 20 kilometers, and this is little z, and we want to find x, little x. So we want to find side x, this is what we want to find, right? And notice that x is opposite angle x, which we do know, and the two sides that we're given are actually the legs of you know the initial and terminal sides the, or the initial and terminal arms of of angle x and we know what we know those side lengths we know what those side lengths are we're given that we want to find the third side so when we know an angle in two of the sides and you want to find out a third side and these are the ways the sides are arranged this is definitely a cosine law problem so it's basically whenever it's basically the combination where you have a triangle and you know this, you know this, you know this, and you want to find this, right? That's a cosine law. But in this case, if you want to, if, if you have, say, this, this, and this, and you want to find this, well, that's a sine law. And that's a sine law because you got to check to see what's opposite what. You're always checking for that. In the cosine law, notice that you can't use the sine law at all. And that's because you have an angle here, all right, but you don't know the length of that third side. There's no way of knowing. And so you can't make a ratio out of this. And also, the other two, the other two sides are known, but the opposite angles are not known. So there's no way you can use the sine law for this situation. Okay, which is why I say that you can only use the cosine law here. Over here, you have, okay, you have a sine law. Is it possible to use the cosine law? Well, for the cosine law, you need to know two sides and an angle, but here you, you have two angles and a side. Well, that's not very good. Um, and we want to know another side, okay? So knowing two angles and a side doesn't give you much to go on. For, for the cosine law, remember, the way those equations are written, um, you have to know two sides and one angle, right? Now, maybe you don't know that angle, but if you don't know that angle, then you better know all three sides, right? But basically, whenever you solve these problems, you have to have one unknown. So that basically, you have to know, in order to find a side, you have to know the other two sides and one of the angles, and preferably this that particular angle should be opposite the side you're trying to find. So in summary, uh, the use cases of the sine law 
are basically, if you have this situation, the dots represent what you know about the triangle. Uh, so if you have this case, this case, or this case, you can use the sine law. But notice that this case here where you know uh, an angle and its opposite side and any of the other sides, well that could also be used for the cosine law as well. This one over here is uniquely the cosine law. Uh, that is that you know a, uh, an angle and the two sides which form the angle but not the opposite side that's a cosine law problem but also the strange and unique case where you know all three sides and no angles at all uh, if you want to find any one of those angles uh, you have to use the cosine law after that after your first angle is known you can use the sine law for everything after that to know the other angles <coughs> So, um, those, uh, that was just another thing that I wanted to show you in terms of knowing uh, what the uh, use cases were for the sine law and cosine law. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do number three for you. Um, it's a pretty standard problem. Uh, the problem says, um, here, let's just show you the problem. The shadow of a shadow of a tree that is 12 meters tall measures 9 meters in length determine the angle of elevation of the sun well that's a, a new terminology right let's say that's your head and your eyes are looking straight out okay and basically if if an object like a bird or something occurs up here or a hovering insect occurs up here we call this the angle of elevation. In other words, it's basically, it could be an elevation, an, an angle that is above, moving upward, um, relative to your line of sight, or relative to the x-axis, or whatever. And this here, conversely, is called the angle of depression okay that's when it's below your line of sight or and so on okay um, so okay so we have a tree and this tree um, okay I'm, I'm gonna move that away from my other diagram otherwise I'm gonna make a mess um, so we have a tree here I'm not gonna draw a very good tree all I want all I'm concerned about is the fact that it's plant it on the ground and here's the top of the tree. That's really all I'm concerned about. So we have the we have the sun shining down and this results in the tree casting a shadow that is this long. It's from here to here. Okay? And we're given in the problem, it's given in the problem that that's nine meters. And it's also given in the problem that the tr tree is 12 meters tall. Okay? Now the tree, because it grows up and the roots grow down, which sounds like a little overly obvious thing to say, but because it goes straight up, we can say that that's a right angle triangle. Now the angle of elevation of the sun means that we're being asked to find this. Notice that this is a right angle triangle problem. So basically we're using what ratio could, could give us that angle theta. Well, we have two sides. We don't need to know the third side. We just have opposite and we have adjacent. And that way we can find theta. So tan, tan theta is opposite over adjacent. It's 12 divided by 9. And tan is allowed to be greater than 1. So we use the inverse tan. Oh, sorry. We use the inverse tan to find theta. And what do we pass into the inverse of tan? We pass 12 over 9. You know, strictly speaking, we should actually put, because tan is a function, and we're treating the inverse tan as a function, we should actually use brackets like function notation. 12 over 9, and this would be tan of theta if you want to put brackets around that too. It's nothing wrong with that. But the inverse tan of 12 over 9 is what? So let's try it. Um, 
So inverse 10 and then make with a fraction and we get 12 divided by 9 and we close our bracket and what do we get? We get, oh, I know what I did wrong. I did not use the inverse 10 or hold on a minute. I, hold on, there we go, that's what we want. We want the inverse 10, so it's second function 10. Ah, so, uh, you should learn from these mistakes too, because you don't want to press 10 when you mean inverse 10. And we put in our fraction, 12 over 9, and now we get our angle, and our angle is 53.1 degrees. So theta is equal to 53 point, is it 1 or 2? 1, because it's a 1, 3. 53.1 degrees. Okay? Okay, so number 11 is a bit involved. Charles leaves the marina, sails his boat 10 degrees west of north for 1.5 kilometers an hour, or 1.5 hours at 18 kilometers. He's kind of going this way. So he's 10 degrees east of north or sorry, west of north, and he's going roughly uh, 18, 18 kilometers for one and a half hours. Now, if distance is velocity times time, this is 27 kilometers, so really his distance here is 27. I'll just take this out for a minute. And um, also... He then makes a starboard or a right turn to a heading of 60 degrees east of north. So if this is north, if this kind of faint line is north, then 60 degrees is this way, east of north, right? And uh, sails for 1.2 hours at 20 kilometers. Well, 1.2 hours at 20 kilometers turns out to be 24 kilometers. So I could put a 24 there. Now here's the problem. You see, this here is an angle of 10. This here is an angle of 60. But we don't know this angle, <laughs> right? And we also don't know, like, here is the journey. This is the resultant vector. We're going, you know, from where he started to where he ended up is really kind of the resultant vector, right? How far is Charles from a starting point to the nearest kilometer? Meaning, this is the distance we want. We'll call that, I don't know, x. This will be big x. This will be little x. And this will be y, and that will be z, I guess. So we know, we know little y, and we know little z. We can see here that um, this is angle x here. And uh, the reason I say this is 110 degrees is because this is an angle, because this is an angle of 10 degrees with respect to the y-axis or with, with, with respect to north. Uh, this fine line over here is parallel to this line. So if this is 10 degrees, and by the z rule, that's 10 degrees. We were told that this was 60. So what's left over is that this is 110 degrees. But we knew this one is 10, and we know that one's 60. And we know that this, by the straight angle theorem, is 180. So 180 minus 10 minus 60, that only leaves 110 degrees. That's why I know that. Okay? So now, how do we find x? Well, we have a side and a side and, and an involved angle in between. That's a classic case of the cosine law. Okay, so let's try the cosine law. And I'm just going to grab the pen. So the cosine law says that x squared is equal to 27 squared plus 24 squared minus 2 times 27 times 24 times cos of 110. Okay, and um, if you recall, that comes from the cosine law, you can pick any one of these sides. They're just letters of the alphabet. So if this is our x, then everything else is known. The two involved sides are known, and the angle that's in the middle of those two sides is known. And that's what we have. So this time we just plug this into our calculator. So here we have 27 squared 
plus 24 squared minus 2 times 27 times 24 times cosine of 110. What do we get? 1,748. But of course, that's x squared. x squared is 1,748.3 approximately. So x is the square root of that. So we'll just uh, delete that and do the square root of what we got the last time and 41.81 so it's approximately 41.81 kilometers and is that right I mean I drew a scale diagram here for a reason because I wanted to show you one of the beauty of one of the most beauteous things of having a geometry set is that I can actually you know if, if one millimeter here was equal to a kilometer I think I got the 42 pretty good. Um, if we just look, 42, this is pretty damn close to 42, isn't it? 41.81. And here we got, here we got 42. So, and that was a, a rather tiny little diagram. The bigger we draw the diagram and the more respect we pay to scale, the better this diagram is. But what is this? What is this angle from the north? Um, in a, you know, if we're going to measure everything with respect to the north, then we slap this on, and use. We could use our. You know, basically, what the cosine law does is it leaves you with the internal angle. It doesn't say, you know, what angle it is with respect to the north. Um, but a scale diagram like this one will definitely smoke it out for you. So we have here, with respect to 90 degrees, it looks like about 23 degrees. 23 degrees, and this will be east of north. Okay? So that's um, that would be that question. That's question 11. And notice it's got a lot of things going on in this question. You know, we have to find distance. It has this distance time thing so that we can find the lengths of the sides. So distance is velocity times time. And um, and then in this case we have to find the cosine law. But it wasn't going to... This, this uh, problem was not written in a way that they were going to give it to you easily, right? You had to get that x using the little tricks you learned uh, earlier in earlier grades where you had to use the z rule and you had to use the a straight angle theorem and so on. Okay, with re with regard to that. All right. So here's a three dimensional problem for you. Suppose you want to find the height of this cliff, and maybe you're making a map of the area. You're over on this side, and you're separated from what you want to measure by a river, and swimming across and climbing it might be dangerous and prohibitive in many ways. Um, so you decide not to do that. In fact, there's a way of measuring um, there's a way of measuring these things without having to get wet at all. In fact, you only need to ever stay on this side of the river. You never have to go across. You never have to go to the top of the other side or anything like that. Um, and your only equipment need be maybe normal, normal measuring trundles or measuring tape and a compass perhaps. Um, so let's say that you pick a landmark over here, which I just marked X. Maybe it's a particular shrub that stood out or a, a rock that was particularly large and noticeable. I just marked that with an X. So, we want to find out this height, the height of this cliff, the height going straight up. We have this river separating us from our target, so we need to go directly across, directly across from this mark, this landmark, to where we are, and we make our own landmark. We can do that, okay? Um, because we can do what we want on our side of the river. And then we measure a definite distance. Say we measure 5 meters. So I'm going to measure 
by scale 5 centimeters to signify 5 meters and uh, here we are so I'm gonna end there and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that that is 5 meters now I also notice that there's a I'm not I don't know this distance let's say that this is I don't know almost 90 95 degrees just enough to throw throw you off if you're really treated that as 90 so we'll call it 95 degrees the other angle you can measure is this one because it's on your side of the river so you can measure that one as well so you take a compass and you place it on that on that corner very carefully and you see that the angle is about 73 and a half degrees we'll say 73 degrees so that's 73 degrees you find out that actually because you know two angles and a side you actually can use a sign law in this situation to find out any side you want on this triangle and that's because 95 and 73 when you add them together and subtract from 180 let's try it so let's see 180 minus 95 minus 73 okay we get 12 degrees so that's not a very it's not much of an angle but it's an angle 12 degrees I said that was 95 slightly obtuse maybe maybe I should have said 85 but whatever so 95 degrees that's what I said and I'm my story and I'm sticking to it so that means that for let's say that we want this side so maybe we want to know this side this is X we'll call it X okay so this must be angle X okay so sine 73 degrees over X big X is going to be equal to sine 12 degrees over 5 right um, yes my pencil is dark enough matter of fact I don't know why I don't have the light on here I don't know if this does anything maybe it just makes it yeah it just washes things okay anyway sine 73 over X equals sine 12 degrees over 5 so then you solve for X by cross multiplying actually what do you do multiply both sides by X and you get sine 73 equals X and then you multiply by the reciprocal so times 5 over sine 12 degrees so you have 5 times sine 73 over sine 12 so 5 times sine 73 divided by sine of 12 and you get 22.99 meters nine nine meters or why don't we just say 23.0 meters okay so this river is 23 meters wide well all right then you measure with your compass again from where you are on the river here to the top of a hill and you find out that this is 21 degrees obviously this part is a right angle triangle this cliff is going straight up it's a right angle triangle that angle is 21 degrees this we know now to be 23 23.0 meters okay and so now we need to find the height well the height is the y value well we'll call it h so a measure of 20 one of the trig ratios involving this angle 21 degrees that involves the adjacent and the opposite is the tan right so tan of 21 degrees equals opposite which is h over adjacent which is 23 if we multiply both sides by 23 you get 23 tan 21 degrees which is our h and so H is what? 
23 times tan of 21, you get 8.8 .8 meters. So the height of the cliff is 8.8 .8 meters tall. Not a hugely high cliff, but it's still a good two stories high. So we use the sine law to resolve this triangle. And we and remember, we, we only had to focus on finding certain sides, right? So we had to focus on um, finding really the width of the river. You know, that would be a good number to have. And if we knew the involved angle there, then you can find the height. In fact, knowing a side and an angle for anything involving a right angle triangle is, is a way to find all the sides. You can find all the sides of a right angle triangle if you know one side and one angle. So that's basically a three-dimensional problem, an example of a three-dimensional problem involving the sine law. Okay, so uh, we have a problem here where uh, Jody and Liana are on top of a cliff and the cliff is a hundred meters high and that point is called point D. They decide to race to a picnic table at A, okay, where lunch is waiting. So Jody runs at a constant speed of five meters per second um, down this way and then this way. So she runs downhill to point C and then runs the rest of the way to point A where the picnic table and lunch is waiting. But um, Leanna instead climbs down 100 meters at the rate of 1 meter per second, reaches point B, and then runs this length toward the picnic table. And when she does run that length, she's running at the same rate that Jody is running. We just don't know what that length is. So the question is, really, who actually gets there first? Who reaches for lunch first? So, first of all, we've got to find all our lengths. And the idea is that um, we need time, right? We, we said in an earlier problem that velocity is distance over time, but we need time. We need to solve for time. So really, instead of this, we need uh, time is distance over velocity, right? If you multiply both sides by time, divide both sides by velocity, this is what we're after. But we know the velocity of both of both girls, but we don't know the distance run. In fact, we're not given really much of anything except for that 100 meters. But actually, we're given quite a bit because we're given an angle and a side. And we also know that because that's a cliff, that's a right angle triangle for this triangle, but it's also a right angle triangle for this triangle as well. The only triangle that is questionable is this one, is the one on the flat ground because this middle angle is 70 degrees and these ones are probably not 90. They might be many different angles but 90 probably won't be one of them. And so um, we don't really need to know very much to be able to know how far uh, to know how far uh, Jody ran down to point C because we can just do, this is, this is just a sine problem, right? This is our hypotenuse, and this is the opposite side. It's opposite 15. So opposite of our hypotenuse looks like sine. So sine of 15 degrees is opposite over hypotenuse. Well, it's opposite is 100 meters over our hypotenuse. Well, this is the line DC. We want the length of, of this, of DC. All right, so uh, if, that's, if that's a length, we can multiply both sides by DC, divide, divide both by sine 15, and we get this. So we get uh, DC, DC equals 100 over sine of 15 degrees. Okay, so 100 divided by sine 15, 100 divided by sine of 15. 100 divided by sine 15, I get 386.3, let's say around 386.4 meters, roughly. Okay, so 
this is 386.4 meters. That, that's this length over here. Fair enough. Well, okay, we need to know... Um, also, in order to know this side, we know, have an angle, and we have a way of knowing that side because that's a right angle triangle. We also have a way of knowing that side. If we know that side and that side and that angle, we can use the cosine law to find this angle, right? So that means that, well, we, we got to use Sokotoa again to find the length of BC and also to find the length BA. So, okay, so BC, line BC would be what? Well, okay, it's going to be cosine. Uh, well, no, not really. Tan, we, we'll use tan. So opposite over BC, which means 100 over the line BC, is our tan of 15 degrees. The length of BC equals 100 over tan 15 degrees. So, all right, once again, 100 divided by tan of 15 degrees. All right, and we get 373.2. So it's approximately 373.2 meters. So I'll put that down, it's 373.2 meters on along this side. So we know one of the sides of this triangle. We need to find this side because uh, Leanne traveled this way and this way. It, it turns out we don't really need to know anything about th this hill because what Leanna did is she climbed down the cliff and then she ran along the flat section. So in this case, we want AB. So AB is really, uh, well, if we want... If we want to decide which trig function to use, maybe we'll decide first. AB is the adjacent side to 10, and this is the opposite. So opposite over adjacent makes 10. So 10 of 10 degrees equals um, opposite 100 over side AB. And it looks to me like, well, it's, it's a slightly different number. So we're going to have to have AB, line AB, equals 100 over tan 10. Okay, and 100 over tan of 10, 100 divided by tan of 10 degrees gives us 567, boy that's more than half a kilometer, uh, 567.1 meters. So this is 567.1 meters. So AC, sorry, AC squared this is going to be the cosine law equals 50, 567 point one squared plus 373.2 squared minus 2 times 567.1 times 373.2 cosine of 70 degrees right so we got a, a fair bit of big numbers here but that's fine I got a big number but it's big for a reason because it's the square of a number so don't be afraid that just because you got a massive number like that uh, there's still some things we haven't done yet so AC is really the square root of 316,109.18 so we'll take the square root of this number and we get 562.2 meters. This is the, the last leg of Jody's journey, right? So her total journey, because, so for Jody, and so DC plus AC, well, that's 386.4 plus 562.2. And I get 189. 0.7 seconds for Le for um, for Jody. Well, what about Leanna? Leanna had two speeds. So here's the speed for Leanna. Leanna had climbed down a cliff at 100 meters 
at one meter per second. So we have 100 seconds for Liana. All we need to figure out though is the time for um, distance over, over velocity for, for Liana. So it's 100 plus distance 567 567.1, that's her distance on AB, divided by 5 meters per second, because in that section she was going just as fast as Jody. So we add, so we get 5, 567.1 divided by 5 is, is sorry, 113.42. We add 100 to that total, and we get, sorry, 213.4. Um, 213.4 seconds and so Jody, so Leanna took longer Jody actually was faster so Jody arrived first <laughs>